Hello, welcome you cozy couch potatoes. Hello, my cozy couch potatoes. Welcome back. This is Spice Rep Serious Cozy Couch, and we are continuing with chapter 28 out of 29 um, for the people of Sparks. Chapter 27, the fire broke out. Um, June got Torin out, and Lena and June and other Amberites decided to help the water lines, the fire line, um, with Dune, of course, yelling traitor at them. So let's show, jump in. Surprising truths. Mm -hmm. I bet Torin comes clean. Fighting the fire was so hard that Lena forgot to be afraid. Everything but firefighting was erased from her mind. Her, her hands reached for the next bucket over and over and over. And when a warning cry arose, she would look up to see where the danger was and dart out of its way. The water in the barrels soon ran out, and the rear ends of the lines had to move back to scoop water directly from the river, which meant a longer distance for the buckets to travel. The lines snaked left and right, moving to follow the fires, which sprang up in the dry grass like a crop of terrible weeds. In the smoke dimmed there, people looked like ghosts, swarming every which way, shouting at each other. Once Lena caught sight of Dune, he had jumped into the fountain and was bent over, as if fishing with his hands for something at the bottom. He jumped out again, soaking wet, and in a moment, the fountain began to overflow, and the water spread, running toward the flames in the grass at the plaza's edge. Oh, Dune, hooray, Lena thought. She saw Maddie, too, several times, appearing and disappearing in the swarm of firefighters, sometimes calling out instructions or warnings, sometimes just passing along the buckets, her hair flying in the wind. It was the wind they fought against as much as the fire. It blew its unruly gusts, and the flames leaned and stretched before it, reaching for, the, reaching for new things to burn. For there were twice as many people fighting the fire now, and before long the people began to win. The flames became flickers put out with a shovel full of dirt or a splash from a bucket, and finally no trace of orange remained in sight. The plaza was a landscape of ashy puddles and smoldering black heaps, looking strangely open without the town hall and the pine tree. Then for a few moments, people just stood and stared at each other. All of them had smoked darkened faces and ash-dusted hair and damp, grimy clothes. The people of Ember were just as grubby as the people of Sparks, Everyone looked more or less the same. Lena went searching for June. She couldn't find him, but she did find Mrs. Murdo sitting on the ground at the north end of the plaza. Her bun had slid all the way off the top of her head and was hanging beneath one ear. Her skirt was dotted with burn holes. Are you all right? Lena asked. I believe so, Mrs. Murdo said. And you? I'm fine, said Lena. Yes, you are, said Mrs. Murdo, giving Lena a long look. Very fine indeed. She held out an arm. Help me up, she said, and we'll go back to the doctor's house and get ourselves decent again. When the fire was out and all the firefighters were exhausted and wet and dirty, Loon discovered that his legs felt shaky again, and he went down through the village streets until he found a shady place under a tree where he could sit for a while. People trudged by him, heading for their homes, and the people of Ember passed too, going back to the hotel, which that morning they thought they might be leaving forever. June didn't call out to anyone. He felt too tired even to talk. He just wanted to rest a minute before facing whatever was going to come next. But he hadn't been sitting there very long before he saw Kenny coming up the road. And when Kenny spotted him, he came over and sat down. I saw you, he said. You pulled Torin in from the tree. June nodded. I knew you were that kind of person, Kenny said. Bits of ash sprinkled his blonde hair as if someone had shaken pepper on his head. What kind, said June. The brave kind, Kenny said. The good kind. Not like that other boy. What other boy? Kenny leaned back against the trunk of the tree and stretched his legs out. The one who was yelling for the people to fight. The one with the pale eyes. Tick, said Dune. Yes. I knew he wasn't a good one ever since I saw him in the woods that day. What day? Dune said. That day when he was out there with bags on his hands. Tick has been stealing food, just for himself, I bet. That day, when he was out there with bags on his hands, Kenny said, Dune turned to stare at Kenny. Bags? Why? What was he doing? Cutting vines, said Kenny. What kind of vines? Dune asked. 
His heart was starting to pound. Well, I wasn't close to him. I'm not sure, but it was something he didn't want to touch. <gasps> Tick poisoned them. Tick got the oak and put it on the step. It wasn't the Sparks people. I, I blamed Ben, and I feel bad for that, but Ben was being a butt, let me tell ya. But it was something he didn't want to touch, I guess, like poison oak. Poison oak? Why would he cut poison oak vines? I heard what happened, said Kenny, about the leaves on the hotel steps. They thought we did it, but I don't think so. And guess who didn't touch them? Guess who knew what it was and didn't get poison oak? Dune's thoughts were racing. He was remembering things now. How Tick had an itchy patch on his arm. Days before the stuff appeared on the hotel steps. How he, had, how he led the cleanup but didn't participate himself. How he had smudges on his neck. The morning that go back to your cave was written on the hotel walls. How he stirred everyone up, fed their anger by reminding them of those two attacks over and over again. And as if his mind had been full of clouds, but now was clear, he understood. Tick needed all that anger and outrage. The more upset people were, the more of them would want to fight. And the more fighters there were, the more people for Tick to lead. Tick wanted the power. Tick wanted power. He wanted glory. He wanted war with himself in command. He had raised his army by attacking his own people. Tick, 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 tick. Tick, 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 tick. Okay. June was breathing fast. His hands were cold and shaky. He knew suddenly that this changed everything. It meant that the people of Sparks had not attacked the people of Ember after all. Their fears and suspicions had made them unkind and selfish, but except maybe for the muddy words in the plaza, they had not attacked. And if there hadn't been the writing on the wall and the poison oak, there probably wouldn't have been the riot in the plaza. And if there hadn't been the riot, the town leaders might have not decided, might not have decided that Emberites had to leave. Dune jumped to his feet. Startled? Startled? Kenny said, what's the matter? You've told me something important, Dune said. He held out a hand and pulled up Kenny. I have to. I have to. What did he have to do? He had to talk to someone. He had to explain. I have to get going, he said to Kenny. And he headed back up to the road toward the village center again, thinking about whom he should talk to and what he should say. <coughs> the doctor was standing out in front of her house with Poppy. At her side, when Lena and Mrs. Murdo arrived, Poppy came galloping toward them. Weena, she yelled. I saw Fio, I saw Fio. Are you hurt, Dr. Hester asked. Just tired, said Lena. And dirty, said Mrs. Murdo. Dirty, dirty, said Poppy, tugging at Lena's shirt and trotting along beside her. Torin was sitting on the sofa with his feet in a tub of water. What happened to you, asked Lena. I got burns on my feet, Torin said. On your feet? How did you do that? You didn't see, said Mrs. Murdo. See what, said Lena. So Mrs. Murdo told her, I don't know why Dune was up in that tower to begin with, she said, but it was a lucky thing for Torin that he was. Lena raised her eyebrows at Torin. Dune told me what you said about him. Aren't you ashamed now that he saved your life? Aren't you ashamed now that he saved your life? Torin didn't answer. He stared down at his feet. You lied, Lena said. You blamed Dune for something he didn't do. Torrin slumped down into the sofa pillows. He didn't throw those tomatoes, said Lena. He would never do such a thing. Why did you say he did? It was a mistake, said Torrin, Torrin in a muffled voice. Well, who did it then? Someone else. Who? Just someone. I'm not telling. You are telling something, though, said Lena. Maybe you won't tell who did it. But you, but you have to tell that Dune didn't, 
She shuffled through the clutter on the table and found a scrap of paper. Here, she said, handing it to Torn with a pencil. Write on here that you told a lie about Dune. Sign your name. Scowling, Tor scowling, Torn wrote. He handed the note to Lena, who headed for the door. I'm going back to the village, she said, just for a little while. I'll be home by dinner time. After dinner that evening, Lena did a lot of talking. Mrs. Murdo and the doctor wanted to know what was out there in the empty lands and how it was to be a roamer and what the city was like. Maddie, sitting at the window seat with a cup of tea, put in a word now and then, but mainly she let Lena tell the story. Torrin sat on the couch with his feet stretched out. The doctor had wrapped them in rag bandages and pretended not to listen. But every now and then he couldn't help asking a question. Usually, usually his questions had to do with Casper. I don't understand, he said, why you two came back and not Casper. He hadn't finished what he wanted to do, said Lena. His mission. What was his mission? cried Torin. You must have found out. We did find out, Lena said. She glanced uncertainly at Maddie. Your brother, said Maddie, is looking for something he will never find. When he realizes that, he will come home. But what is he looking for, Torin said. He reared up on his elbows and glared at Maddie. He is looking for a treasure, said Maddie, but he doesn't recognize it even when it's right in front of him. Did he forget his glasses, Torin said? No, no, but he has trouble seeing even with his glasses on. Lena didn't like Torin any better than she ever had, but she did feel a little sorry for him. So she fetched glasses of honey water for him that evening, and she gave him a little red truck. She gave him the little red truck she'd found as a roamer. Poppy seemed to think all this was a kind of party for Torin. She joined in by bringing him things to play with, spoons, socks, potatoes. When it was bedtime, they carried him into the medicine room, and then Lena went with Mrs. Murdo and Poppy up into the loft. Mrs. Murdo unpinned her hair, which fell around her shoulders in strands clumped together with soot. I have something to say to you, she said to Lena. Lena's heart sank. Whatever it was, she was sure she deceived. She was sure she deserved it. I saw what you did, Mrs. Murdo said. You did a remarkable thing, running out alone like that. Quite courageous. Well, I had to, she said. Mrs. Murdo raised her eyebrows questioningly. Lena was too tired to explain about trying to do a good thing to change the direction and how she had hoped that someone else might do it so she wouldn't have to, but nobody did. So she just shrugged her shoulders and said nothing. Mrs. Murdo ran a comb through her hair. I believe a great many of us were thinking of doing the same thing, she said, but no one quite had the courage, only you. I didn't feel courageous, said Lena. I felt afraid. That makes it all the braver, said Mrs. Murdo. Lena felt a glow, like a little flame inside her. No, not a flame, a light bulb. That was better. A little light bulb was glowing in her heart. I believe I'm more tired than I've ever been in my life, said Mrs. Murdo. And tomorrow, there's more to face. Tomorrow? For a moment, Lena couldn't remember what had to be faced tomorrow. Well, yes, said Mrs. Murdo. I suppose tomorrow we'll find out if they're still planning to make us all leave. All right, that is it for chapter 28, but there is a town meeting. So I'm just going to go ahead and try and continue that here. The fourth town meeting. That night, the wind cleaned the smoke from the air, and in the morning, the sky was a brilliant blue, and the air felt tingly. The sunlight was warm, but it had a new quality, thinner and sharper. The season was changing. <laughs> a messenger from town arrived at the hotel that morning. Dune, who happened to be the first person up, ran into him on the hotel steps. Tell your people, said the messenger said the messenger, that the leader of Sparks wished to meet with the people of Ember at noon today. They will come to the hotel ballroom. Dune conveyed this message to the next several people he saw, and they told others, and soon everyone knew. At noon, they assembled in the ballroom. Dune stood with his father in the midst of the crowd. All around him, he heard uneasy murmurings. Would this be more bad news? He heard Miss Thorne whisper to someone, I'm so nervous, I have a stomachache. He was nervous, too. His hands were damp. At a few minutes after 12, Mary Waters, Mary Waters and Wilmer Dent came into the ballroom. 
With them were four men carrying a stretcher on which Dune saw a blanket draped figure. Did Ben die? The stiff gray beard jutting up from the chin told him it was Ben Barlow. Dr. Hester walked beside him, and with her were Mrs. Murdo, Lena, and Poppy. Other townspeople followed, lining up around the edges of the room. Dune recognized storekeepers and team leaders, including Chugger, along with many of the families of, Spark, of Sparks. The Partons were there. He saw Kenny trotting behind his parents. June raised his arm and called to Lena, and she came to stand beside him. Is Ben badly hurt? Dude whispered. I think so, Lena whispered back. The doctor said he was hit in the shoulder. She said the blast almost blew his arm off. Listen, June said, I have to tell you something important. And in the next few minutes, as the town leaders and the men carrying Ben mounted the steps to the stage, he whispered to Lena what he discovered about Tick. Really? She kept saying, really? Oh, could he? I can't believe it. And last night, Dune whispered, I went and found Tick and I told him I knew. And he said, but at that moment, Mary Walters, Mary Waters held up her hand for quiet. Dune stopped whispering and turned his eyes to the stage. The men had set the stretcher down and propped one of one end of it on a chair so that Ben lay at a slant. A bandage covered one of his eyes. He glared out at the audience with the other. When Mary spoke, so he's not dead. When Mary spoke, there was a slight quiver in her deep voice. We are here to talk of serious matters, she said. Ben was badly injured yesterday, but he has insisted on coming. We all wish to speak with you face to face, she paused. First of all, I must tell you this. Dune felt his stomach lurch. We have realized, Mary said, that we cannot ask you to leave here. Your generosity yesterday has helped us remember our own. No one spoke, but the people of Ember glanced at each other and let out breaths of relief. Dune bumped his shoulder against Lena's as, and they grinned. Yesterday, Mary went on, when our weapon exploded and the fire went out of control, a child of Ember crossed the line that divided us from, him, from each other. We are grateful to her for leading the way. Lena! 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 cried a few scattered voices. Lena thought she heard Maddie's voice among them. Dune startled her by yelling, Lena the Brave, right in her ear. I love their friendship. I want to say, Mary continued, that we have made mistakes and we are sorry for them. We had good intentions at the beginning. We did our best to help you, but when it got hard, we closed our hearts. Wilmer Dent smiled apologetically. We were worried, he began. Ben interrupted him. His voice was hoarse and weak, and he seemed to be having trouble breathing. Dune strained to hear him. We were justifiably concerned, he croaked, about critical food shortages, attempting to ensure the safety of our own people. He made a kind of wheezing, gasping sound. Understandably, he added. Wilmer shrugged his shoulders, still smiling nervously. It was just that we were afraid, said Mary. We were afraid. Let us say it right out. We were afraid that you would ruin everything for us. We were almost on the edge of prosperity. We feared that you would push us back into deprivation. There was a silence then in which no one knew what to say. So we tried to get rid of the problem instead of solving it, Mary went on. Fortunately, both our plans and yours went thwarted. She stepped forward and gazed out at the crowd. Her eyes met June's and held them for a second. Just last night, she said, I learned two things that have changed my picture of what has happened here. The first is, we still don't know who wrote the muddy words on the plaza. We may never know, but the other attacks on the people of Ember, the ugly writings on the wall, on the walls of the pioneer and the poison oak on the doorsteps were not carried out by, the, by Sparks villagers at all. The Emberites turned to each other with puzzled looks and murmured confusedly, but how could... But who could? What does she mean? It was young Dune Harrow who explained it to me, she said, Mary. I'd like him to explain it to us all, if he will. She nodded to Dune, gesturing upward with her hand. So Dune stood up. He told the assembled people the same thing he told Mary the night before when he came to her house late in the evening. It can't be true, someone cried out. Dune thought it was Allie Bright who had been Tick's right-hand man. It is true, Dune said. 
Tick told me himself last night. He said it was just good strategy. He said he knew there was going to be war and he needed to raise a strong army. When people are attacked, he said, they get mad and angry people are the best warriors. So he decided to make people angry. He told me he got a good idea for how to do it when he saw those muddy words in the plaza. At that, a roar swelled up and filled the ballroom. People shouted, where is he? And twisted around to look for Tick. A few of them began barging through the audience trying to find him. Dune called out, wait, listen, he isn't here. The commotion quieted down. People turned toward Dune. Last night when I talked to him, Tick was stuffing everything he owns into a sack, said Dune. He told me he was leaving. He said he couldn't live anymore with cowards and traitors. He'd learn. He'd heard a roamer was coming through the village today, and he planned to catch a ride with him. Some others are going, too. They're going to the settlement in the far south, Tick said, where they hope to have a better welcome than they got here. A great clamor greeted this announcement. Some people laughed, some shouted, Good riddance! And some just grumbled and shook their heads. Finally, Mary raised her hands again and called, Please, quiet, I have more to say. People grew silent again and listened. I said that I learned two things, she said. The second is this. The incident that set off this chain of violent events did not happen as we thought. It was not Dune Haro who destroyed those crates of tomatoes. This came as no surprise to the people of Ember, who had never believed Dune guilty in the first place. But the villagers at the meeting looked startled. Dune saw Martha Parton flick her eyes towards him, her eyebrows flying upward, and he saw Orgny give him a quizzical look. Behind them, Kenny smiled a sunny smile. Torin Crane has taken back the statement he made, Mary said. He did not, after all, see Dune Haro throw those tomatoes. He still refuses to say who did throw them. We must make up our own minds about that. But I believe we can be sure that it was not a person from Ember. At that, a cheer arose from the crowd, a loud, disorderly cheer, and Dune was so astonished that he nearly fell over. Lena grabbed his arm. I made him write it down on paper, she yelled into his ear. I took the paper to Mary last night. When the cheering subsided, Mary continued. We should take note, she said, of how easy it is to bring out the worst in us. The actions of a few troubled individuals fanned resentments into violence. Only an accident kept us from murdering each other. She turned around to face Ben, whose head was lolling sideways, his eye his eyelids drooping. Ben has something to say now. Ben, are you able? The doctor standing next to Ben nudged his shoulder gently and Ben opened his eyes. Can you make your statement, Ben? asked Mary. Ben frowned at the ceiling. The audience waited. Finally, he spoke. I have been told, he said, that Dune Haro, he stopped, frowned again. I wish to thank young man named Dune Haro. He took a shaky breath. He took a shaky breath. For rescuing foolish nephew. I didn't realize Ben was his uncle. What? Thought Dune. What's he talking about? Ben scowled. He appeared to be gathering his strength. Foolish nephew Torin Crane, he rasped. In the pine tree. He could have been killed. Ben's voice sank to a whisper and the audience strained to hear. By foolish, by my foolish actions. Dune stood stunned. Torin was Ben's nephew? That was a surprise, but it was even more of a surprise to hear Ben almost apologizing for what he'd done. Lena was thumping Dune on the back. Someone behind him cried out, Three cheers for Dune! And three cheers rang out in the ballroom. Dune just stood there with what he thought was probably a silly smile on his face. Then Mary stepped forward and called for quiet again. Her voice grew steady and businesslike. Now, she said, we must look to our future. You will not get everything you want. Neither will we. All of us will suffer, perhaps even be in danger. There will be more mouths to feed, but more hands to do the work, too. And though we have, and though we may have a shortage of food, we have no shortage of work. She paused. She smiled a little. A little. Her eyes passed over the people in the room, and Dune felt her gaze almost like a reassuring touch. The main thing, she said, is this. We will refuse to be each other's enemies. We will renounce evil 
evil, <laughs> renouncing evil, apparently. Um, we will renounce violence, which is so easy to start, but so hard to control. We will build a place where we can all live in peace. If we hold to that, everything is possible. Someone clapped. Dune turned around and saw his father clapping with his hands held high in the air. There is so much to be worked on, Mary said. It won't be easy, but we'll talk about it together. She paused for a second and a change came over her face, the beginning of a smile. One more thing, she said. We will no longer speak of the people of Sparks and the people of Ember. From now on, we are all the people of Sparks. A rustle swept through the crowd. Both Dune and Lena felt a pang of sorrow. To call themselves people of Sparks meant leaving behind the trace, the last trace of their old home, its name. The villagers, too, felt a pang. For them, it was a pang of fear. These were their people now. Could they really live peacefully together? But the sorrow and the fear lasted only a few seconds. Everyone was tired of sorrow and fear. Whatever lay ahead, they thought, would probably be better. They were willing to try it. After that, they turned to the practical details. Actually, said Alma Hogan, the storehouse manager, there's a fair amount of food in the storehouse. It's just that we never like to use it all up. This year, we'll expect to use it all and hope we can replenish it next year. I, I'm afraid a great deal of it is pickles, though. By the end of winter, we may all be eating more pickles than anything else. Dune's father mentioned politely that the hotel residents would have to have decent houses sooner or later. Mary said they would start building some of them now out behind the meadow. The best of Sparks builders would be in charge, and they would teach the Emberites construction. The houses will be small, Mary said, and will be able to build only a few before the rain comes. Most of you will have to spend the winter in the hotel. Clary stood up to announce that her garden was producing well, in addition to cucumbers, melons, and peppers. She had grown nearly a hundred butternut squashes, which would keep well through the winter. That would help a little. The villagers looked at her curiously. Butternut squashes? They had never heard of them. I grew them from seeds I brought from Ember, Clary said. I brought all the seeds I had, all kinds. Next year I'll be able to grow more. Mrs. Murdo said she had learned a great deal in her time with the doctor. She would like to be assistant doctor. It's clear that this community needs more than one, she said. I know something about plants, said Maddie. Yay, Maddie gets to be a part of it. Speaking up for the first time, I wish to be assistant hotel gardener with Clary Lane. Edward Pocket said he demanded to be made official librarian. Mary looked surprised. We don't have a library, she said. Exactly right, said Edward. You have a disorderly heap of books. I have made great progress with them. However, I invite you to come by and see. Ben Barlow kept muttering dire warnings about crop failures and vitamin deficiencies and epidemics. But Mary said they would cope with those problems when and if they actually occurred. Little by little, people began to feel interested in how this new arrangement was going to work. There were endless questions. What if there were, what if there were arguments? How would they be settled? Would the Emberites go back to eating with their lunchtime families? Would they get enough for dinner and breakfast? What would happen when they needed things other than food, like shoes or soap or hats? The trouble is, said Mrs. Polster, we don't have anything. We can't trade for the goods at the market because we don't have anything you'd want. But Dune saw the solution to this right away. We do, he said. Mrs. Polster raised her eyebrows at him. She wasn't used to being contradicted. We have one thing that you need, said Dune. Matches. We still have a lot left. We could use them to trade with at least for a while. Two matches for a pair of shoes, say. People laughed and clapped. It was perfect. Ben said in his opinion a pair of shoes was worth at least five matches but no one paid much attention. All of, this has, all of this has to be worked out, Mary said. It's going to involve disagreement, and it's going to involve hardship, but we have endured hardship before. We can do it again. Wilmer sighed. It's just that we hoped we wouldn't have to, he said. Mary shot him a stern look. We can do it again, she repeated, and we will. All right, that is it for the meeting and chapter 28. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. And I will see you next time for the very last chapter of the Sparks People, chapter 29. Have a good one. Bye.